Hello everybody, this is Beth Wersdale, author, and I am here, I'm happy to say, with Michael Cofino. How are you? Good morning, good afternoon, I should say now. I know, I know, it's, it's crazy. Isn't it? you're, you're, you're in California as well, like me, aren't you? I am. I, I noticed that you're not quite glowing as much as I am. <laughs> you glow and I don't, that's, that's a reason for that. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me, Michael. Um, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to be doing this interview with you today. Um, before we go any further, I am going to quickly share the stream with the two Writers Rock groups. Bear with me one second. Um, oh, there we go. I see us live. There we go. I'm just going to share it now um, with the Writers Rock group and the Writers Rock Readers Group. I do apologize for this delay. It would be very nice if I could do this beforehand. Unfortunately, I can't. <laughs> it's all good. There we go. Okay, hopefully we're live everywhere. Fantastic. So, Michael, you, you sort of blew my mind when I looked into you because you are a man of many hats, shall we say. Um, now, you're a multi-genre author to start off with, a ghost writer, a freelance editor, blogger, writing coach. You've been an attorney for over 40 years and you've also been a basketball coach. And, and I, I, are you still doing the coaching now? No, no, I actually got called out of retirement a couple of times to help. Uh, my older son and another coach, but no, I'm not. I'm retired. I'm just wondering how you fit all this in. I mean, I, I thought being I, I thought being a mum was hard enough work with kids and juggling that and writing and everything else. But my gosh, you managed to fit so much in. It's it, it's absolutely awe inspiring, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the coaching and the law practice which was the two major things before I got into writing professionally. That was a tough balance, but frankly, I had so much support from, you know, my law colleagues and family that even it was difficult, but it, it, it worked. I mean, in, you know, now the law practice is a very small part of what I do and the private investigation work I do is pretty it's minor. So it's mostly the writing. And I think it's, it's, I think the test really is not so much the quantity of it as it is keeping your mind focused on the task and having to change the focus for a complete, you know, complete different task. For example, before we got on here, um, I was working on a private investigation matter that didn't take a lot of mental brain power, but, but I had to focus on it for an hour or two before we got on. So then I had to shift my, my head. And I had that, that was something I learned to do when I was coaching because I would leave the law office with one mindset, then I had to go into the gymnasium with the high school kids with another. And you just learn to adapt, but it's not easy sometimes. Yeah, yeah. L leaving one mind frame behind and then refreshing your brain, as it were. Um, Bridget Hick Hickey is here with us. Hi, Bridget. Thank you for joining us. If you've got any questions for Michael, Bridget, please type away and we, we will ask Michael for you. Um, now, you have such an extinguished career as an attorney and as a, a basketball coach. Have you always written during that time, or did your passion start later in life? How did it all evolve? Yeah, that's an interesting question. In, in reality, looking back, I did a lot of sort of extracurricular writing while I was a lawyer. Um, I used to write these roasts for anniversaries and birthdays, and they became quite popular. Um, they were, they were fictionalized future predictions of the, the person who was being celebrated. So, for example, if like the very first one I wrote was he had a lot of different interesting traits, one of which is he was extremely competitive, another which he was, um, he, was, uh, he was obsessively athletic. And so I took those, among other traits of his, and I predicted where his life would go in the next 10 years. So I started doing roasts like that on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I also published in the legal realm uh, a number of articles. So I was always into the writing part. Yeah. I was a writing coach as a lawyer to young lawyers. So it was always there, but I, 
I did really try to get the itch to be a professional writer was much later in my life. It wasn't until I, I was in my early 60s that I decided I needed to do it. That's just amazing. Absolutely amazing. We've just had Alton Bardo, uh, another author, join us. Um, we did a uh, an educational day yesterday. Hi, Alton. Thank you for joining us, darling. Um, oh, apparently she says we're not on Writer's Rock Readers. That's not, good. That's not good. People are missing out. Let me just quickly check. I, I will try and share it again. Hang on. Writers Rock Readers. Oh, it might be one to have, may not have seen it yet. She might not have been able to approve it, but I will quickly share it again, just be on the safe side. Hopefully, so, one. Let me ask you a technical question. So, if somebody wanted to, from outside those groups, wanted to get in, how do they do that? Um, they can access it on my page, which is open to everybody. So, we're, stre we're actually streaming on my page, which is Writers Rock Group as well, and the Writers Rock readers, hopefully, as soon as one to sees it, bless her. Um, hi, Jimmy. Jimmy Yesia has just joined us. Thank you for joining us, Jimmy. Um, he's just given us a little verbal wave, bless him. Um, hope, hopefully, we'll, we'll be on lots of different areas. So, what, how would they, what link would they use for that? Um, well, basically, this streams direct to the, the, the various pages, which is fantastic. So as soon as Wanda sees it and authorizes it, it should go on the readers group as well. But the interviews stay on Facebook and they're open to the public, which is great. So anybody can get them. So my question is, if someone someone's trying to get in, I just got a text message, but they can't get in. If they go to Beth Wersdell author, which is my direct page that's open to the public and they can see it live there and then they can just click on it join in and ask questions so we're okay don't go away no no it's all right um we bridget says and we we can do this once you finish bridget says what kind of books do you write now this is a really good question because obviously your your career as an attorney and as a book coach influence at least two of your books that you've released um so i will let you explain what type of books you've published so far sure so i i, I finished i have seven books finished um three of them in the sports genre and that that just flowed directly out of my high school coaching career it was just a natural outgrowth of those um, three or memoir, and I got into that by accident. I'll come really? back. Yeah, I'll get, I'll get, that was a complete accident. I'll come back to that. And I just finished my first novel, which is kind of where I want to go ultimately, is to write fiction, um, you know, storytelling in that sort of realm. The, the memoir stuff, which now has become my bread and butter, was I, I was in a relationship and uh, with the founder of Jim Bree, and she wanted to write her memoir. And I was actually gearing up to start my own career in writing, and I had these sports books on, that I wanted to do. Um, and one I had just started, but I really hadn't been far along. And she said, would you, would you write my memoir with me? Wow. And I, so I tabled all the books I had uh, in the pipeline, and I said, sure. So I wound up writing that with her co-author and with her. And I love the process of storytelling and trying to find someone else's voice which is you know not easy sometimes and i can't even imagine how difficult that is actually because you know you it, it, I'm sh i've never done anything like that and i'm sure if you're writing somebody's life story their memoir you have to convey their personality their traits in your writing that must be very tough I mean, I, it's a challenge i mean i'll give you an example i'm working on one now where i was actually despairing of my ability to do it because um, it was just so hard yeah. uh, to get it right. And what happens is, you know, you get into a flow anytime you're writing, and everyone knows this who writes, is you get into a flow and you're just writing from instinct and your natural skills and and you're expressing things the way you visualize them yourself. But when you're writing a memoir or any sort of book where you're trying to capture the your ghost writing to capture the voice of someone else, that's okay, but you gotta you gotta stop every now and then and look at it and say, okay, how do I need to adjust this? 
I mean, I can't tell you how many times clients have said to me, "Yeah, but I don't, I don't write, I don't sound like that." Yeah. You know, and and that's okay because it's going to happen. It's not easy to do, but that's your obligation. Yeah, it's, to try and be true to your person. Yeah, it's to find, you know, to to tell their story, express their story and their words and their voice, which, as you just pointed out, is not simply word choice, but it's sensibility. Yeah. Like this memoir I'm writing now for, uh, it's, it's a true crime story, I, as I mentioned before you got on live. Um, you know, the client has a bit of an edge, which, yeah. which works for me, because it's natural for me to, to talk like that and write like that. And I'm and, sure you've met pe plenty of people who, who are like that as well. Yeah, so, so that's coming more naturally, because I get her. Yeah. I appreciate who she is, and I can identify with her attitude and, and her, you know, her personality and how she sees things. But but sometimes, like this one I mentioned earlier, where I'm always struggling, I, I do not have that identity. Yeah. And, but that's the challenge, and that's you know, like at the end of the day, you have to keep coming back to it. Is, is, are these are these expressions mine, or are they really the clients? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I I I, I think I. I would find it so daunting, I've got to tell you, because obviously when you're writing, um, you know, other pieces of work, you know, sci-fi or fantasy or romance or whatever, you, you just go with your imagination and, and basically invent your characters and their traits and everything. I can't even imagine how difficult it is to convey a personality on paper of a true person who's going to check it afterwards. <laughs> Well, but you're right. I mean, you know, in writing my novel, I, the, the liberation was wonderful to be able to just go. Yeah. Worry about stuff like that. Uh, and to build your characters and your, and your vision. So that's a big difference. Do you find that your story just flows easier and it, it's, it's more easy to get into your writing zone? You mean on the fictional stuff? Yeah. Well, I've only written one. Uh, novel, but but I can't answer that in, in that con in narrow context. I was actually blown away about how organic the process was. I had read I had read I think it was about two years ago Stephen uh, King's book called On Writing, which is by the way I highly recommend to any writer. Um, and somewhere in that book he he said something that his characters sort of build themselves, create themselves. And I was like, yeah, give me a break. You know, you're Stephen King, right? I don't buy that, but you know, but I, that's how I experienced it. Yeah, I had an idea about something in that book. I had a denouement. I actually, I started with actually the denouement, and then I went back and I just started building each chapter. And in each chapter, I had no idea where it was going until I started writing. And so it was. It really was. I mean, there were certain things I wanted to do. Obviously, and I had ideas about the characters, but in terms of the scenes and episodes, each one got created without any advanced vision. It's the main thing, isn't it? Be, you know, so confident that I didn't have to have everything thought out in advance. That I could just trust my instincts and say to myself, okay, where does this character need to go next to, to be on the journey that he seems to be on? Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've got a few more people joined us. Um, so let's have a look. So Bridget says, what kind of books do you write? So, so far you've done memoirs. Um, sports related books and um, mainly to do with basketball and coaching is yeah. that right well two, two are basketball books and one is that and the third book is actually uh, on high school athletics more generally it's not limited to any sport it's about you know the value of high school athletics as a sort of educational um, curriculum context kind of thing so it's a little it's a little more academic, uh, so it's it, it's aggressive and it's advocacy, um, but it's yes, but it does flow from my my coaching experience. And then the, the other genre is it's fiction, which we've been discussing. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And you and these books are available on Amazon because I checked. Yes, they are. Wonderful review. So so make sure you check out Michael's Amazon author profile because all his books are available there and of course um the book that you co-wrote which was tom delibo 
Oh, yes, that's a memoir. Yeah. That, yeah. Was, a, that was an interesting experience. So, so out of all the books that you've done so far, not include the fictional one that you're working on right now, because that's a whole new adventure that we'll, we'll discuss. Yeah. But out of the other books that you've done and published so far, which ones do you think you've enjoyed writing the most? <laughs> yeah. Do clients get to see this information? <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, I'll, all right, I'll be honest with you. I've had, everyone has been fun. Uh, but, I, but I will tell you, I mentioned earlier, I think, um, this memoir I'm writing now, which is a true crime story. And I don't think I have been as engaged in any project other than my novel than this one. And um, it, not to get too deep in the weeds, but it's, it's, a, it's a, the client is a woman in her 40s and her father was murdered in a twin homicide in Arkansas uh, about 20 years ago. And then a month later, her mother was kidnapped. Oh my gosh! And so, and there's a whole obviously narrative that goes along with that. And, uh, and, and but I, one of the things we did in that situation was I used Freedom of Information Act requests to get all the investigative files out of two states, Utah wow. and Arkansas. And I, I have tons of material, and way more than I need. And so I've been diving into the investigative files, the interviews, all that stuff, and putting together a a storyline for her that's pretty similar. And I think I, 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 that's where I realized that combining my, my lawyer background and my private investigation work um, is a great asset to me in terms of writing true crime type memoir. And I've had, I think I've enjoyed this one more than any of them. I, the nice thing is, is that, I don't, I don't it was going to sound awful. But there's been so many prolific crime events um, in in this country and in the UK. Obviously, in the UK, we've you know we've had Jack the Ripper and all sorts. Um, but there's so much history there, crime history, for you to pick from. Now you're working on this project. You must be rubbing your hands, thinking, "Okay, once I've got this out, what can I get into next?" Well, I'm at, for the first time, I'm thinking that I might want to do more of these. Yeah. It, becomes, it came so natural to me. And as a lawyer, even though, you know, I wasn't a criminal lawyer, I was a, I was a civil trial attorney. Um, I understand the language. I understand evidence. I understand how cases get investigated. It's just a different context, but, but I get it. And, um, you know, in my novel, for example, I've got two courtroom scenes. They're not major scenes in the book although they're important in the sequencing, uh, but there are two, there, there are some legal scenes in there. And um, I love the writing in that, in that situation where I was making it up, um, you know, be able to invent a Q and A in a courtroom setting. was a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, to kind of create moments and learn how to pitch um, a, a witness on the stand with a lawyer examining that witness in a way in which drops off the page a little bit for the reader. Do you know, as soon as you were talking about that, do you know what image was popping in my mind? That law, that lawyer movie that was based on a book. You can't handle the truth. Uh, Tom Cruise, Jack Nicholson. That's the one. A few good men. Great, great. That's some good writing there. Yeah, I could just imagine you doing something so dramatic like that. We've got lots more comments. Um, so Bridget says... Oh, what, which book would you recommend for a new reader of yours? A new reader? I'm not sure I follow that question. Out of your books. Out of my books. Out of your books, what, which book would you pick or suggest for a new reader of yours to try? Well, in terms of what's currently available, I think that would be a book that would have more general interest than the others. I mean, sports books are, you know, not every. I mean, if, you, if you're if you a parent of a high school ath athlete, I would highly recommend my book on high school athletics. But in, in terms of general audience thing, I think like the first memoir that I, I co-authored, Play It Forward, would be um, the book that appeals to a broader base of audience. Yeah, men and women alike. 
Yeah, I think the you know the the, the novel I've written that hopefully someday that would be I mean if that was published I probably would have recommended that but it's not, and this memoir I mentioned about the crime author would be one too. But I think of the ones that are published, and that's a fascinating story because it's not only the story about how someone founded Jim Barif out of literally out of a basement. Yeah, he built it not only to an international brand but a franchise business that allowed women as early as the 70s to both be at home and run a business at the same time which was revolutionary at the time it's a fascinating story and then to have her completely crash and burn because she had a, a, a major eating disorder and then to go away for a few years come back be gone from jimbery and then to start a, a small little yoga business empire in the Bay Area, uh, which she wound up selling to Yoga Works, which is a national franchise for um, pre uh, national franchise for yoga studios. I mean, it's a fascinating story about not only how to build a business and be entrepreneurial and someone who made a major contribution to, uh, to women in business as early as the 70s, but also, you know, sort of getting down, hitting, hitting really low, 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 and then coming back out and being successful again. Yeah. Very, very inspirational person, very great story. Absolutely, absolutely. I think I'm gonna to have to read that one myself. Okay, so uh, what have we got here? Oh, Nancy Gerlich Picard has joined us. Hi, Nancy. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, oh, bless her. She said it was really hard to find, but she's here now. I was trying to text her, that's why I was texting. Oh, well, thank you for joining us, Nancy. Thank you, thank you. Um, she says, uh, I will attest to that. Oh, I will attest to that. He loves doing the, the, the memoir. Um, Bridget says, when will this be published? So the crime, crime book that you're doing at the moment, when are you hoping to actually get it released? Well, that's a, that, that's a funny time question because we were discussing it yesterday um the answer of course is we don't know um but it'll be done in a few months uh, probably two or three months and then she's got to decide whether she wants to roll the dice and try to find a traditional publisher with an agent and, and that'll take you probably into 2022 right yeah uh, in terms of release or to hybrid publish it and get it done earlier. So I'm hoping that we'll go in the middle route, and I would think maybe sometime in the spring. Okay, okay. But you have a you have an author website, don't you? So um, yeah. I recommend anybody who's interested in Michael's books, um, make sure you join his website mailing list or whatever, um, and then you'll get the most updated news of Michael's events and new releases. I think that's probably the, the the best thing to do there. Now, I'm I'm so inspired by you, Michael, because as I said, not only ha do you wear so many different career hats, um, but you're just such a talented writer. I, I, it amazes me how you're able to go from something that's you know fact and things that have happened to now move to a fictional arena about crime and everything else. I mean, it's so exciting for you. Do you think you will continue down the fictional path more so now than, than the memoirs and stuff? Yeah, I do. I, I think that if I was to you know, write my own script, I would say, I mean, you know, I do the legal work and I do the private investigation work to make sure I have cash flow in, in the system. Um, but that I think memoir writing is going to be a mainstay because I love writing the stories and I love trying to find the voices, um, you know, to express the other people's stories and, and, and their voice. Uh, I love that. But I think in terms of the creative realm, um, and I've got a number of projects you know, sort of lined up that I'll do a lot of fiction eventually. It's just a matter of, you know, if, if I have a clash in terms of my schedule, like for example, um, I, 
I put my own book on the back burner for the last three or four weeks because I've had obligations with my memoir clients to deal with. So they're going to always, that's always going to take precedence. Yeah. And they're clients and, and they deserve that attention. So like now I'm getting to a point where I see some light at the end of the tunnel, then I'll move back into my stuff. So at some point I'll have more free reign. And, um, but, but that's the model I see, memoir and fiction. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it's nice that you're able to do the two at the same time. I think it's brilliant. And it also shows other authors that they are, you know, they, they do have options. They don't have to just stick with one type of writing or one specific genre and that you can experiment and do other things too, which widens your audience. Well, you know, it's interesting. I was, I was following a thread about uh, two or three weeks ago uh, one of the Facebook writing groups uh, on the subject of, you know, what do you do when you start running out of gas? And, you know, they were just, everyone was just giving their two cents about what works for them and stuff. And it's interesting. And there's also been, a, there's always a lot of writing about writer's block. And I've never had to worry about writer's block. My, my problem has been when to stop and take a break because I think that and that's the good thing about having a number of projects going on at once is that, you know, if, if you're not at the top of your game, you need to stop and do something else. It doesn't mean necessarily you need to go into another writing project. It could be anything. It could be exercise, washing the dishes, whatever, doing the laundry, anything. So your mind rests. But you need to recognize when you're starting to like gloss over words, not reading all the sentences, you know, your mind isn't completely dialed in and, I, and I'm not good at that because I sometimes push myself but the great thing about having multiple projects whether it's a private investigation thing I was doing this afternoon or another or, or a different kind of memoir or editing something because I do some editing is that you can you can't stop and refocus and then come back later and I think that's how you're you could be prolific what you do is understand what your limitations are and when you're starting to lose your edge i i completely agree and and it's funny because i it's funny that you say about giving your brain a rest because i don't call it writer's block ever i call it having a creative rest and you're absolutely right and i'm the same way if, if you know if i start staring off into space which is quite common for as authors um and I just can't, you know, the inspiration just isn't striking. I do exactly what you, you know, you suggested. I do go and do something else, give my brain that creative break to, to recharge. And, and it does help because by the time you finish doing something else, you do feel like you've had a little creative break and, and you know, a bit of brain rest. When I was writing my novel, um, and this is literally the truth, Several scenes came to me while I was hiking. Really? When I was just, when my mind was completely at rest. And uh, I was by myself just walking and all of a sudden, boom. You know, the kind of things that don't come to you when you're, when you're, when you're a little bit stressed about getting your work done at the desk. Um, I mean, even in the middle of, I don't know, I'm sure writers do this all the time. I was reading something, Jerry Seinfeld would talk about this, how he, he'd wake up in the middle of the night with a joke, and he, would, and he would write on this, he would write it down. George Carlin did the same thing. And, and I, I wake up sometimes in the middle of the night with an idea, um, could be, it just could be a paragraph, or it could be a scene in the book. And I don't trust myself to, to remember that three hours later. So I get out of bed more often. Yeah. You know, and I'll write it down, or I'll actually go to the computer and, and write it up. Yeah, I have my phone right next to my bed, and obviously, when I'm you know out and about and everything, I have my phone on me at all times. So I will verbally record it quickly, or quickly type it out on my notes. <laughs> and I think it's I think it comes down to trusting the process of you know how your mind works. Yeah. If, you know, obviously, if you're on it, if, you, if you're working against the deadline, that's a different kind of thing. And you, you've got to press a little bit. But if you don't have a deadline, um, trust that great ideas, inspirations and thoughts will come to you when you're at least trying to make them happen. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. I will absolutely agree with that. So Bridget says that sounds good. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, Jimmy says, did you take any writing courses? Wow. 
Um, I don't think I ever did. I mean, I've I've um, I've I've watched stuff online, but I never really took an actual course other than what we might have done in college. You know, Jimmy is a ringer, by the way. If it's my friend Jimmy, he and I met in an English class or speech class. Oh, really? <laughs> He's in um, That may be as close as I ever come to a writing class. No, I don't think I've ever taken a writing class. Remember, I had 40 years of legal writing and training. Yeah. So, and I went, and my, my first 17 years as a lawyer was at a preeminent firm who was highly regarded as, as producing great legal writers. So writing was highly valued there. So I had great tutelage and I became a writing coach there. And so, I mean, in a matter of speaking, I had writing training, but not in the traditional way. Oh, I understand. He said, yep, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> He's a ringer. A ringer. He's, a, he's a songwriter. He has to ask it. He's a songwriter. Oh, really? oh, I'm a songwriter myself. So, hello, Jimmy. Nice to see you. Uh, Bridget says, um, your, oh, what is your favorite genre to read yourself? What books do you like to read? I, I mean, I think I read a lot of different things, but I think in terms of, I mean, I read a, I read a lot of books on writing. Yeah. We're putting those aside, and I read a lot of books in connection with my projects. For example, I'm working with a Marine on his memoir, and so I read, I read a lot of books that are military. But that's you know, key to the project. But in terms of just pure entertainment, I mean, fiction is the thing I read the most, and, and memoir writing, mm. right? And sometimes you know, historical nonfiction stuff too, but memoir and, and fiction. It's amazing, isn't it? I, I, I love our, I, I thank you very much, Bridget, for asking that question because it's one of my favorites. I always find it quite interesting to find out what authors actually like to read because sometimes it's completely different to the genre that they actually write. That's interesting. Yeah, it's not that way for me. I, mean, I, don't, I don't read science fiction. I don't read romance, even though I know how popular they are. Uh, yeah. It's not what I enjoy. Um, I, I think what I read is more tied to what I write. Now, tell me, Michael, have you ever been in the dilemma or, you know, thought about the dilemma, whether to write for yourself or to write for the current market? Because I know there are authors out there that, that do both, aren't they? You know, there are some authors that just follow their heart, do what they love and enjoy reading, whereas there are career authors who make a living just by following the writing trend at that time have you ever had that, that you know, that's that's a very timely question for me um and i can definitely respond to that i've had difficulty finding an agent for my novel and and looking and, and i've done a lot of research and i've put a lot of time into that process and what i have learned is, is that my novel really doesn't fall within the top group of commercial uh, works of fiction that sells. And so I've had discussions with Nancy, who's online there with this and others about, do I have to commercialize some of my fictional work? Mm. For example, I have a, um, I have another novel I want, I have two other novels that I've outlined in my head that I want to write. Neither of them are really earmarked for a high spot on the ladder of what sells. So I'm now grappling with the question, to what extent, if at all, do I tweak the stories to make them more commercially attractive? And I, I, I don't, I haven't, I haven't resolved that. But I think, I'm, I mean, I'm tempted to do it a little bit, but I'm saying it's counterintuitive and it, it bothers me. And I just have to get over that, I think. You know, I have to just kind of grow beyond that, I think. But I've, I'm not there yet. Is it? It's a very, very difficult situation, isn't it? And I do feel for you because um, I, I think society, in a way, is still recovering from you know the tw Twilight era and the Hunger Games era and and these huge book series that took the world by storm. I think it does go to show, though, that there is a huge market for most genres 
uh, especially crime. You know, when you think of like John Grisham, he's got a, a massive following for his books. Um, and I think sometimes as authors, we just need to emulate what top authors are already doing for our genres. Yeah, I, you know, look, I mean, I'd be lying to you if I didn't say that my main attitude was, no, I'm not, don't make me do what I don't want to do. Um, don't tell me I, I could do it. I, I could write what I want, but the reality is it's hard to monetize this career, yeah. which is part of the reason that I've stayed in memoir because I can, I can earn a living that way and then do what I want on the side. But you know, everyone wants to write a bestseller yeah. or an award-winning book at some level. And you know, you either have to find out whether you're capable of doing that or you have to make some adjustments if that's your goal. If that's your goal. Absolutely. And it and I, it's definitely having realistic goals, isn't it? Now, are you a goal setter? Do you set yourself goals and targets for, you know, your you, how much you write a day or yeah. how productive you are? How do you, what is your writing process and schedule for yourself? Yeah, I do have a, I think I probably have a routine that I follow generally. I mean, it depends on obviously what's going on at the time, but I usually write in the morning or early. It could be any time between, you know, five and nine or so, 10, in that range. It depends on when I get up. And then I'll get exercise. Either, you know, in, that, in the old days, I went to the gym. We ain't going to the gym these days, right? But now yeah. I'll go hiking and I'll work out at the house. And then I'll come back and work again. And I'll usually work till the late afternoon. And then the question is, what am I doing at night? If I'm with my partner, Nancy, who's watching this, I may not write at night. But, you know, when I'm alone, I definitely will write at night. So I'm, I'm basically writing in two or three hour segments throughout the day. Yeah. And, you know, again, hearkening back to what we discussed earlier, as soon as I recognize that I'm, that I'm not at the top of my game, I just I try to stop. Yeah. But I'll, you know, I'll work past 10, 11 o'clock if I'm by myself. Yeah. yeah. Saturdays and Sundays are, are fungible days to me. You know, they're all the same. I mean, it's, it's a seven day week in terms of my, you know, so maybe I won't write much on a Thursday, but I might wind, wind up writing a lot on a Sunday. Yeah. Well, I, totally get that. I totally get that. And, and it's nice having that flexibility, isn't it? Um, Nancy says, <laughs> Revelant, um, Relevant versus commercialized is very different. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, 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 as I said, I think it's something that we've all sort of thought about in, and um, considered what to do and having that dilemma. I mean, you, your question earlier, which kind of got buried a little bit there, I think, is, is, is one of goals, right? I mean, yeah. it's, you know, what, what's your vision for yourself? Um, if, if your ego is leading the way and you want to get recognized at some high-end level that you're somehow a distinguished writer, well, you, you, unless you're just super, super talented in, 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 in the rare way, sort of that rarefied air that, that some are, you have to make adjustments to what you write. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you, you have to look at what... What's selling? I'm I'm losing you for a, for a second. I don't Tough know. One. Oh, there we go. You're back. <laughs> you froze for a moment. Then it's a good job you wasn't. Yeah, well, I don't know why. <laughs> it's a panic moment. Panic. <laughs> but you're back. You're back. For you, what have been your literary influences? Uh, has it? You know, has other people inspired you, or has it been mainly your careers? What what really has inspired you and given you the most creativity? Interesting question. Um, well, let me. Uh, this might surprise you. To tell, I'll tell you who my favorite writers are, and um, this may this may surprise you. Every time I every time I tell this to someone, they look at me. Uh, <laughs> Favorite writers are Charles Dickens, Oscar Wilde, and Hunter Thompson. <laughs> Those are my three favorite writers. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. And, um, oh, I think that's wonderful. 
but you know, in terms of inspiration, you know, I just I did it actually this morning. I was reading it. I'm reading a book, which is absolutely fascinating, and I just exclaim, "Oh my God, what a great sentence this is!" And so that's the kind of thing that actually inspires me. I, I, I just read someone, just a book that you know I, I picked up and someone recommended, and I'm into it, and, and I'm just marveling at the sentence construction or the use of imagery and that sort of thing. And to me, that's it, it, that's why if you read a lot, that's going to happen often. Yeah. So, you know, those are my favorite writers, and I've read virtually all of their things, uh, including Dickens, although it's been a while. Been yeah. Charles Dickens uh, is, is just all you know, Just reading a lot of different people and, you know, highly acclaimed books and seeing, you know, how, how they express themselves and the pace of their writing and, and how they use simile. And, that, you know, that's the stuff that inspires me. Yeah. Yeah. Now, obviously, you, you are a member of our Writers Rock group. Um, which is absolutely fantastic. I hope that you found some benefit from it. Um, do you think that being part of groups and um, writing communities has been important for you in your development? I in a couple of ways, I think it's very helpful. I think um, one is sometimes you'll be, not sometimes, more often than not, you'll find uh, common threads on a, on a topic that... Um, it's really useful just to read. You, know, you don't have to weigh in at all. Just to read through them and find out different perspectives. You know, it could be, it could be a very, it could be a situation. For example, you know, I, I, I'm part of an, a ghostwriting group on Facebook, and oftentimes you'll get client problems. Here, here's my situation, and you'll spell it out. What do I do? And everyone, of course, you'll get a million ideas. Um, and but, but I read that. Um, just to learn about yeah. what's going on out there. And, and sometimes the other thing is, I think sometimes it's good to hear things that affirm your work, affirm yeah. decision making, affirm how you see things. Because it's sometimes as a writer, you feel like you're out there on an island. Yeah, very much so. The fact of the matter is, we're not. I mean, I'm constantly blown away by how many authors there are out there just endless, endless numbers. And, you know, it's it's good to hear people comment on things and you say, oh yeah, that, I, that's how I experience it. And that's an affirmation and you feel a little bit more connected. Yeah. So I think it's very valuable. You know, I think, I don't, I don't comment much. I read the threads and I find that to be educational. Absolutely, absolutely. It, it's, it's nice, as you said, feeling like you're, you know, part of a community where other people have done it, seen it, got the T-shirt and can give you a little bit of advice. Yeah. Because <laughs> it, it's been amazing how much I've learned since book one to now. Um, it's just a constant learning curve, isn't it, I think, for, for all authors. Now, have you ever been to book events or about creating your own book events? Obviously not at the moment because of, you know, some of us are still on lockdown and stuff, but yeah, something I, that you. Yeah. I had a um, when we wrote "Play It Forward," the book on the Jim Bree experience. It happened to coincide with the 40th anniversary of Jim Bree, and and we were it was very fortuitous because Jim Bree was willing to finance a national book tour. Wow! And so we wound up, and I, I'm going to share it. One of the things we did, I think it's pretty interesting. So we had all these book events at bookstores and different places. Then we also did some workshops. Um, for example, uh, we put together a panel of women, women at the 92nd Street Y in Manhattan um, on entrepreneurial uh, initiatives that women have taken and succeeded. And we had, I think we had about six or seven women, um, well, well, you know, New York, and um, I was sort of like the MC, although I didn't get to get a word in at points, but it was okay. I was more a prop, but um, so we did that. But the book, but the bookstore experiences were really special. Well, we yeah. I came up with a format where um, I would I would introduce a reading, and then Joan would read from the book. Okay, so, so I would set up I would set up the narrative about what maybe would happen before that scene kind of thing. And she would read from the book, and then I would ask her a question about what she read. 
And so uh, we tried it out once here at a place called Book Passage here in Marin County, and everyone loved it. So what we did, we took that format and we took it all over the country. And, um, you know, we went to a lot of book events where we used that, and, and it was a lot of fun. And of course, we would invite our audience on as well. That was fantastic. It was, really, it was a great experience. It was a great experience. Where have you found the most useful resources as a as an author? Do you you know are you subscribed to any particular websites or online groups? Um, where do you find help when you need it, or or you know the best advice when you need it? Well, it depends on the advice. It's an interesting question. I mean, I I think generally speaking, I have like my own personal library of reference books. I mean, I've got tons and tons of books and, um, you know, I don't read them front to back because to read reference books front to back a lot would, you know, melt your brain a little bit. But um, I, I just read a book on copy editing, for example, that I was blown away by. It was so entertaining. Like, it was like, how, how could you write a book on copy editing editing and have someone laugh the whole way through. It was really good. <laughs> really oh, so you might have to add that in the comments because it might be a good read for most of us. <laughs> anyway, so it was, it was just brilliant. It was brilliant. And and so I have a lot of those. But if I have a, a specific circumstance where I, you know, I need to, you know, like for example, I, I have to make a proposal today or tomorrow uh, for a, to write a book proposal and maybe do the memoir after the book proposal. And it's a little tricky because for a reason I don't want to get into, but so I, I might call a literary agent that I know um, and just get their feedback. So, I'll, you know, uh, or I might just run it past my, my partner, Nancy, to get her instinct. So I think it's, it's, it's always good to have people you judgment you trust to run things by. Um, and, you know, like on these, I, I'm not the kind of person who's going to put it on one of the groups on Facebook. Uh, even though that's what it's commonly used for. I'll, I'll listen to what they have to say about their problems, but I'm not good. I don't usually share my own. But I'll just, I'll just, I'll just pass my stuff over to people uh, whose confidences I value. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the writing, the techniques, and, and you, know, the, the, you know, the different rules and nuances of writing, and you know, the point of view and a scene and all that kind of stuff, I have tons of books that I confer with. How to write dialogue, that, that kind of thing. That's fantastic. Now, uh, oh, Jimmy says, wasn't there also a cruise with Jamboree? Oh, yes, there was a cruise. This was actually a fascinating experience, except for the fact that I was sick the whole cruise. Oh, um, no. Uh, uh, thickness. Um, what happened, this is a longer story I'll make short. A, a Singaporean-based company bought a part of Jamboree, and is in connection with that sale, um, they hosted a cruise experience that began in China and went to a couple of countries. It was a week's time. And the only people on the cruise ship were, was Jimbery families and Jimbery employees and officials. Wow. And, and Jonah and myself. And, um, yeah, we spent a week. I was, I was really sick that week, but we spent a week on, 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 on well, I'd never been on a cruise ship before. So it was my inaugural experience. Uh, uh, but it was, but one of the things we, we, the main thing we did that there was a, there was a, a slideshow and Joan did a presentation. And so we worked on that ad nauseum before the cruise ship uh, uh, event. And it was, it was, it was quite great. It, it was, what was interesting about it for me is she was like, you know, the second coming of Mahatma Gandhi on the ship. I, no, really, we couldn't go anywhere, anywhere. Literally, without oh. being um, besieged by people who wanted autographs, all these families and children of families, contemporary families in China. That's and it was I was like blown away. I had actually had a protector sometimes, you know, but um, it was quite extraordinary. Quite extraordinary. That's just amazing. Now uh, we've got about ten more minutes, so I'm going to try and get in a few more questions before right. before we have to before we have to go down. Um, what would you what would you advise other authors? Are there any specific do's or don'ts that you would recommend? Just from your publishing and writing journey. Wow, that's a 
interesting question. Um, well, the first don't that I would suggest, and I just would you suggest it. I think it really depends on each individual writer, to be honest. I wouldn't push this very hard, but I, I think it's a mistake generally to show your work to too many people. I think you just bargain, you get, you get, you're bargaining for trouble and to create all kinds of doubts and stuff like that. I think if you want to run your, your, your prose by somebody, you have to carefully select who they are. I mean, I, I, I'm very, very discreet with that. And part of it may be ego, you know, I mean, to be honest, uh, but part of it is not getting myself in a sort of a slippery slide into everyone's two cents about this or that. It's like telling people that the name is you have picked for your child that's coming, you know? Yeah. So, and you're so proud of you, you like to have a book title, right? You're so proud and you say, well, we're going to name our kid X. And they go, oh, interesting. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, you realize what the initials are going to be. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, that's, that's a don't. Um, I think the do, frankly, is, is, and I know this is a cliche, uh, so forgive me. I think you have to believe in yourself. I think you really have to, you know, say, you know, this is, this is who I am in terms of how I write and, and trust the process and be patient. I mean, it's interesting because to be perfectly honest, you know, I had so much uh, legal writing training and I was highly regarded as a legal writer, frankly. And I was, like I said, I was a writing coach and all, but I, I, I knew so little ultimately I learned about writing until I started doing it professionally. Yeah. To copy editors, humble writers, you know, and I have a great respect for their work. And so I think what I've now resolved that there's so much great upside down the road in terms of my writing skills, even though I, you know, I think I'm doing a pretty good job, but it's like, I, I don't think I really know how good it's going to be yet. And I think you have to trust that that's the reality for all of us. You just got to hang in there. Yeah. Absolutely. That would be the, that would be the do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think it's you know, it, forgiving yourself for making errors and learning the hard way, I think, ha plays a part as well. Well, I would, I would say one other thing, because I just wrote an article that's getting published this month, uh, and it's called um, The Art of Self-Editing. And uh, there's a couple of pieces to it, but the one thing I'll just mention here is the is to having the courage to kill your own darlings. Yeah, be ruthless with your own work. When we wrote Play It Forward, we, we submitted the manuscript to the publisher. Um, he was very complimentary, and we you know we had a meeting in Chicago about it. It went really well, and he really was flattering and stuff, and that was great. And then we got back the edited copy of it. And, you know, it was one of the, the brilliance of good editing is that you read it, and it doesn't sound any differently than then you know. Then you then you submitted it. But if you ever saw the track changes, you'd probably think have an angina, right? But but that's a, that's great editing. Um, but but I noticed that my favorite sentence in the whole book was gone. Oh no! I, and I, I actually thought that sentence was brilliant. And and I was like, my first reaction was, "You son of a bitch! How dare you!" <laughs> But I, went back, I went back, I held my tongue, I went back and I read the the, the new version, the, the paragraphs, and I thought, oh, you know what? He's right. It doesn't serve the story. It's a purpose. And that was a great comeuppance moment. It was kind of an aha type moment where I thought, I need to have the nerve to do that to my own work before someone else gets to it, right? And so I wrote about this in this article about it, self-editing. I said, there's, a, there's empowerment that comes from the ability to toss your favorite phrases in the garbage. And now I do it with regularity. I don't always do it. I might miss one or two. Um, you know, they, everyone loves their stuff, right? But when you learn to edit out phrases that you fancied wonderfully once, because you know that doesn't really work, that you're just showing off, I think you've come to another level in your writing. So that's another do, Yeah, I would say, for your own darlings. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's something that I'm learning to do. <laughs> it's not easy. It, it, it's tough. It is very tough. Now, do you have um, a collection of 
beta readers and advanced readers before you actually release to build up your reviews? I've never used a beta reader. I probably should, shouldn't I? I, I you know, I mean, I, I, for my novel, I had a developmental editor do an evaluation and I took her changes and recommendations, not all of them, but most of them, and I revised it. And then I got it copy edited and, that, and now it's clean, it's scrubbed, it's so scrubbed. But I've never went the next step, which is what you're suggesting. I've never done it. And I suppose I should, but I'm not there yet. Now, what do you prefer? Would, do you prefer um, self-publishing or do you ideally prefer to go through a literary agent and publishing house? What is your personal preference? Well, I've done all three, self-hybrid and, and uh, mainstream. And, you know, I, I, I've read so much on this subject. And so I don't, and there's a, there are a lot smarter people than I that, that can talk about this. But um, I think it comes down to uh, a couple of things. I think control over content and book cover and stuff and the, the marketing promotion. Um, and, you know, rolling the dice on maybe you, you've got the big book. I mean, the problem with... Yeah, look, and there's the ego piece, of course. Everyone wants to say, hey, Simon and Schuster published my book. You know, a Random House published my book. I, I, I would like to have a Random House name on my book, you know. But you have to be realistic. And, you know, probably, you, know you know as well as I do, they, they don't spend a whole lot of money on you unless, you know, they, they see the upside is huge. You know, that's so. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think given, there, I mean, I just did some research on, um, for both a, client, a memoir client and myself on hybrids. And there are literally over a hundred uh, potential hybrid publishers out there. You know, some specialize in certain niches and you have to, you know, dis disregard those and some aren't as highly regarded as others. But, you know, it's, it's a reputable path. So, for example, the true crime memoir I'm working on, we're discussing the possibility of going hybrid. And the main reason is not only control, but it's the timing of publication. Yeah. And because she's eager to get it published, and there's a TV program interested in things. So, you know, we, we're trying to line it up that way. But, and I've self published a book. But the problem is, you have to be able to walk, you have to have the money and effort to want to do something about that. It's always just going to sit there. Yeah, absolutely. It's a con uh, for myself. It's a constant, everyday thing. Is getting online, promoting the hell out of them. I mean, there's no easy answer. I think the one thing I'm just, just I know we're running out of time, but just one quick thing on Play It Forward. When we we had a major agent on Play It Forward, Trident Media in New York, and um, they were gaga over the book, big book, you know, that right, big book, and we're like, damn, all right. Um, but um, the first 10 publishers, rejection. Okay, they went to their second tier. Next 10, rejection. Next 10, re 30 rejections. And so we started talking to hybrids. And the last mainstream publisher who got the book proposal bought the book. But it was such a torturous process yeah. of getting these friendly, oh, it's so interesting, but. No. Uh, I've got a little poem. It's not a poem, literally, but all my agent rejections from my novel. I've taken excerpts from every one of their correspondence and made it into a little litany of I'm sorry's. That's fantastic. Hybrid avoids most of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Oh. It, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you, Michael. My um, God. Yeah. Yeah especially because you know you, you you've got so many hats that you wear and 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 such exciting plans for the future especially with your crime fiction i am really excited about that so so i i will be joining your website to get the newsletter and your updates um thank you so much thank you for having me it's been fun it's it's been absolutely wonderful would you come back and talk to us once your your crime fiction is released and tell us all about it course i love this this would be great that would be lovely thank you darling now for everybody who's watching thank you so much for joining michael and i um it's never too late to ask questions so if you're not able to view this live 
still feel free to ask questions in the comment section and Michael will try and answer them as and when he possibly can. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, this video will be on my page, the Writers Rock page, the Writers Rock Readers page, and I'll also be uploading it to the Writers Rock website. So if you want to check out Michael's interview and all the other um, authors that we've interviewed, you can see them all in one place, all on Writers Rock because we're getting really organized and we're quite proud of it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael, and hopefully we will see you again soon. Okay, take care. Thank you, darling. Bye. Go on.